Hi everyone and welcome to a chem safety webinar on mould and the impacts on health. We have had a busy winter assisting clients with mould issues from water ingress and today I want to tell you a little bit about why mould forms, what the health effects are, and how to do a risk assessment and how to best remediate. This is from a building from, uh, this is, these are photos from a building that I inspected, which was abandoned after the earthquakes. And you can see a range of mould present here. In this instance, the sprinklers went off, creating an internal flood. On the left hand picture, you can see black spotting on jib plasterboard linings. On the photo below, you can see uh, grey vinyl with clear water staining on it. And then on the uh, blue carpet beside, there's a lovely amount of white, black, grey and brown uh, mould spotting, which is quite heavily contaminated. Then on the uh, red carpet on the right, you can see where the water came in, creating that lovely pattern of uh, heavily contaminated white mould. Mould needs a couple of things to grow. First of all, it needs food. Uh, food is typically in the form of cellulose, which can be found in timber, on paper, and in other um, household goods such as clothing and furnishings. It also needs water, um, and that's why when uh, unexpected water ingress occurs into a home, uh, we uh, get proliferation of mould growth, which can then go on to cause health effects. Now, when we talk about uh, particular items that are affected by mould, we discuss porosity, and there are three terms that we use for porosity. The first one is porous, and these are materials that easily absorb or adsorb moisture, and if organic, can easily support fungal growth. This includes clothing, textiles, padded or upholstered items, leather, taxidermy, paper, and some artwork. Semi-porous materials that absorb or adsorb moisture uh, they do so slowly and, if organic, can support mould growth. This includes unfinished timber and masonry. <coughs> then there are also non-porous materials, and these are materials that do not absorb or adsorb moisture, or those that have been surface treated and do not easily support fungal growth. This includes finished paint painted timber, glass, metal and plastic. Now, absorb means to take in and hold liquid, and adsorb means to hold liquid as a thin film on the outside of surfaces. So with food and water, we get mould. And the pretty colours of those mushrooms are uh, there on purpose. We see mould in lots of different colours, uh, mainly in white, uh, brown, and uh, black and grey but we can certainly see them in lots of other colors as well because there are so many different varieties. Next, I want to talk to you about the types of water ingress and damp. Penetrating damp is when the building envelope uh, has a break or a leak in it, and that lets in rainwater and other forms of moisture, which then gets trapped in wall and ceiling cavities, causing mold growth. Breaks in cladding can include cracks in masonry, uh, poorly uh, fitted flashings or non-existent flashings, and leaking roofs. Then we move to internal leak. These are from failed plumbing fittings due to corrosion, cracking, uh, just general wear and tear, incorrect installation, and also from sealant failure around uh, places like showers. These are typically slow leaks, causing rot to internal framing timbers. And as they are slow leaks, we do not often see visual signs of water ingress in the living spaces, meaning that they can go on undetected for quite some time. Condensation results from poor ventilation in indoor areas, particularly in the kitchens and bathrooms, which naturally generate a lot of additional humidity. But also, when there isn't enough of ventilation in living spaces, we get symptoms such as crying windows, mildew, and that musty odour. We can also see mould growth on clothing, 
and furnishings, carpet, and also particularly behind furniture where there is reduced ventilation and the increased humidity in the air can get trapped between the piece of furniture and the wall, generating mold growth, either on the wall or on the item itself. Then, of course, there is blood, quite self-explanatory, but can be from weather events, as we've seen in New Zealand with global warming, or can be from an internal leak, like the pictures I showed you earlier where the sprinklers uh, went off. Also from a hot water cylinder failure or a burst water tap inside the property. Rising damp is from ground below the home, usually affects basements and lower levels of buildings as the water wicks up from the foundations. This could be due to no or insufficient waterproofing, incorrect materials used, and also no barrier between concrete foundations and timber framing. When mold on building structures occurs, it can result in poor indoor air quality. And this is where we usually get called in, uh, where mold is either visible in occupied areas or people are getting symptoms of mold exposure. So it's the, the mold spores themselves that become airborne are the things that can cause the, the health effects. But also the increased humidity from water ingress can make occupying that space uncomfortable. Then there are people working in construction and trades who uncover mold, building moldy building materials, or maybe removing the mold themselves. During disturbance, such as um, removing mold affected items, the spore levels will increase, generating an inhalation hazard. And also some fungi can cause skin and nail infections, which means that the people handling these items are, have a higher risk of contracting such infection. As well as mold from water ingress in structures, there are certain types of work where mold exposure can occur. Of course, people handling mold contaminated items are also at risk of exposure and health effects. This can include waste processors, refuse station operators and refuse transporters. And the ag agricultural sector can also come across moldy items such as moldy hay, grain, seeds and mold affected timbers. The health effects that people can experience are many and varied. There are so many different types of mold and people react to those uh, types of mold very differently. And that's why there aren't any workplace exposure standards for mold itself. We have to use other risk assessment techniques to determine whether the levels of mold present are uh, of concern or not, because mold is everywhere in the environment, it's ubiquitous. Um, some is normal and okay, but too much can cause a problem. The most common um, health effect we see is hay fever type symptoms, watery eyes, itchy throat, sneezing, and this can be caused by allergenic types of fungi, such as aspergillus and penicillium. We can also see general respiratory irritation and asthma and chest tightness type symptoms as a result of mold exposure. Then there is infection, respiratory or chest infections, which are caused by pathogenic fungi such as stachybotrys or black mold associated with the leaky building crisis, and also catomium, which is a mold that is often found on mold affected carpets. And of course, there are those skin and nail infections that can occur by, from these types of fungi also. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a rare lung disease where the lungs become inflamed due to an allergic reaction to certain inhaled substances, and mold is one of those substances. Mycotoxins are chemical compounds produced by some fungi and can be hazardous to health. They can become airborne and therefore inhaled, or um, they can uh, settle or be present on food, and eating that food can cause health effect. Molds that generate mycotoxins include alternaria, penicillium and aspergillus, which are common indoor fungi, and stachybotrys, that black mold. Health effects include respiratory irritation, weakened immune systems, allergy type responses, and other acute and chronic health effects. Of course, there are other uh, effects that make mold in an indoor environment unwanted. 
It can damage furnishings such as clothing, carpets, curtains, um, and furniture, and, and these are costly to replace. In addition, it can cause structural damage. And types of fungi that cause this are called deteriogenic fungi. They can cause soft rots in timbers and can cause structural damage as well as needing to be replaced, which again is costly. Some water ingress can generate undetected spread, making the problem quite large before anything visible uh, is present in the occupied areas or before any significant health effects are noted. Monk fungi can also degrade irreplaceable materials such as memorabilia, papers, books, um, and other items that are very important to a sports club or individuals. Now, wherever, wherever there is mould, there is also water. And water and electrical items don't play well together. So uh, need to also consider damage to electrical wiring whenever you have water ingress present in a building. How do we identify a, a problem with mould? So we complete a risk assessment. And we do that by completing a visual inspection we also take samples of the air and surfaces and even bulk material of mould. And we start to build a picture of what is going on inside that indoor environment. Then once we have gathered all of that data, we, do, we look to see whether the um, data is telling us if there is a real risk of health effect and how, how high that risk is. Then we can look at how we can control that and keep and make sure that people stay safe and healthy. There are, of course, visual clues that we look for. Now, this first picture isn't so much of a clue as it is in your face. Uh, it looks like it's a case of penetrating damp or an internal flood situation from an upper floor. But the shape of the, that mould there indicates that the water has run down that wall and likely inside the wall cavity as well creating this sort of rain, um, rainfall of mould coming down from the ceiling. Quite obvious, that one. A little bit more subtle is where we see bubbling of paint on, on top of the substrate. And this could be because the water has simply gotten in between the substrate and the paint, causing that bubbling. Uh, we can also um, see a kind of waving um, deformation that indicates that the jib plasterboard linings have been affected and have started uh, to break down. This is where we see the um, effects of condensation and high humidity within a um, occupied space. We see that the mold um, is present on the carpet here and it kind of looks like in the shape of a piece of furniture or a couch. And this is because there is elevated humidity within the indoor space. There has been reduced ventilation under between the carpet and the um, item of furniture on top, and mold has begun to grow. Next is water staining on ceiling tiles. Now this can be an indicator of a roof leak or a leak in, in piping in, in the ceiling space. So whilst these types of stains can be quite common as they are easily formed on this type of tile, it is a visual clue and does need investigation. And of course, there is the smell. Um, mold can smell musty. Um, and once you have been in a, in a few places where there is a mold problem, you do get to know that smell pretty well. Next, we get to do some science. So we get to collect some samples using these analysis techniques. Um, we, we collect samples using uh, these types of items and then analyze those samples. So the top one here is spore trapping. We sample air on, through a, um, an air sampling pump onto a, a, a slide, and the spores get trapped onto a wee gelatin bubble on top of that slide. We then send those samples to a microbiological laboratory where they identify the mold species present and give us an and, and, and count how many of those types of species are present. 
Um, this is a really useful technique because it detects both viable and non-viable species. So vi viable species are able to uh, grow. They're alive, essentially. Non-viable spores are, um, cannot grow, but both viable and non-viable spores uh, can cause health effect. In addition, this technique can detect stachybotrys, that black mold, which not all techniques can do. Then we have uh, swab sampling, and we can use this technique to identify uh, any visual mold that we see. But we, but we mainly use it on surfaces where we cannot see visible mold because it can help give an indication on whether the soft furnishings in a room or the general surfaces in a room have been contaminated by airborne uh, spores. You can also look for bacteria, which is really helpful to give a, an overall picture of what's going on with the air quality in the room and the cleanliness of the surfaces. Gelatin filters are another air sampling technique. So we draw air through a gelatin filter using a air sampling pump, and then we send that off to the laboratory as well. The gelatin filter is diluted and cultured, and the mold and bacteria species uh, that, that grow up in that culture are identified and counted. Now, this technique only looks for viable species. It doesn't detect non-viable because it is grown. But what it does do is gives us an indication of what bacterial species are present, which is really useful when we're assessing the um, the, the um, level, the, the HVAC system of a building and whether it is working optimally or whether there might be contamination within the ducting itself from condensed drip trays. Um, or, or contaminated filters. Tape and bulk samples are used to identify mold species. So we use these where we see um, visible mold present. The bulk sample is where we take a piece of timber and get that analyzed, for example, or a piece of jib board. Uh, and tape samples is where we place a piece of sellotape over an affected area to pick up some of those spores in an attempt to identify. Next, we move on to our risk assessment. And there's a few things that we do um, to, to form this assessment. There is the visual inspection, which I've spoken about, and the analysis. A really key part of the um, analysis and sampling is to do an outdoor reference, particularly for spore trapping. As you'd um, be aware, the air um, in different seasons changes. The levels of microbes within the air changes seasonally. There are more microbes in autumn, for example, due to leaf litter drop than there are in our hot, dry summers down in Christchurch. And of course, different um, areas of the country have different um, species at different times as well. So that outdoor reference is really key for helping us to determine if there is an amplification inside the building or if there are species inside the building that aren't present outside. How do we determine what is normal? Well, our outdoor reference is really key for that, but also where we see a majority of our samples is Biodet Microbiological Services, and they have a really good database um, of thousands of samples. So they have a good understanding of what is normal in a building, and they provide some laboratory guidelines with their reporting, which are really helpful in completing that risk assessment. We then look at the types of species present. Some aren't very hazardous, but then some are toxigenic and can cause disease. So the species that we typically look at are Aspergillus and Penicillium, which are an allergenic type species and cause hay fever. And they are often associated with uh, mold affected buildings. Now there are low levels of these, uh, these fungi out in outdoor air, but where there is a mold problem inside, we see a significant amplification. Species that we really don't want to see any of in indoor air, preferably, are Stachybotrys, black mold, again, because it's toxigenic, 
and um, catomium, which is another toxigenic species and not typically found in indoor air. We also need to consider who is occupying the space. Are they immunocompromised? Are they elderly? Are they very young? All of these groups of people can have a, a more significant uh, health effects from mold. So we do need to consider how the space is used. If we determine that there is a health risk, we need to now form a plan on how we control that health risk. What do we do? Our first consideration is always, should this area or building be occupied? Do we need to remove people from the area while we remediate that space? So isolation is really important. But we do take that very seriously. Um, there could be some quite significant ramifications for vacating a building, for example, or a home. So we need to make sure that our risk assessment process is robust. Of course, we want to stop the water ingress um, because if we don't, it doesn't matter if we remediate it, the problem will just come back. So we need to identify where the water ingress has happened and how we can stop it. Sometimes it's very simple. If there's been a flood, for example, we'll know exactly what the water source was and the Probably, and it's typically quite easy to, to fix, but the water ingress may be a bit more tricky in the case of a leaking roof, for example. I'm sure um, if you ask a roofing contractor to find the leak in the roof, um, they that can be very difficult because the leak, where the leak is in the roof and where the water is coming through the ceiling can be quite a far distance apart. Also, if we have um, no visual cues on the interior of the living space, we might not know where the mould reservoir inside the wall cavities is. So we may need to do some destructive investigation to determine where the mould is hiding. And that can cause additional cost and delays to the project as well. Now, once we have identified where our mould is, we can remove it and we should remove uh, mold that has affected um, porous materials, so those materials that really hold onto water well. In the case of structural timbers, we may be able to treat that timber. We may be able to um, use a fungicide to paint on top of the framing to prevent further mold growth. Well, that, that needs to be carefully considered because we need to make sure that the timber is structurally sound still, and we don't want the mold contamination to be too severe. We want to make sure that that level of treatment is appropriate. Additional types of um, treatment and removal methodology include using a hydrogen peroxide fog to get into all those nooks and crannies. And there are some other specialist techniques that can be used on porous materials that are of significant value, um, but these should all be discussed with your removal um, con uh, company. And of course, a validation. Re removal validation is really important because it ensures that the space is suitable for occupation and it must be done prior to reinstatement. So the removal contractor should go in, uh, set up and remove the mold, um, uncover where the mold is if necessary. And then a consultant can come in, uh, preferably an occupational hygienist can come in and do some removal validation. They will do a visual inspection as well as ear testing to ensure that the ear is clear. We don't want to reinstate the building while the ear has still got a heavy amount of spores in it because those spores could settle out onto other, uh, onto building materials. And if water is present, um, grow into mold and you've got the problem all over again. I have been involved in several removals um, where we have had to do several rounds of validation testing to make sure the spore levels in the air are low enough that they are not of health concern. Uh, it can be difficult to remove them from air. 
some removalists use negative pressure units or air scrubbers to help with that process. Of course, prevention is better than cure. So there are things that are within our control to minimize the likelihood of mold growth in our buildings. We want to regularly inspect and maintain the building. Clear the gutters, check the roof for leaks, ensure there is good drainage around the buildings to stop that rising damp. Repair any fixtures and fittings promptly to prevent water damage. Please don't use bleach or ammonia on mouldy, um, non-porous items. These um, substances can react with mould and generate volatile compounds that can then be breathed in and cause health effect. Warm, soapy water is plenty to remove the mould um, off those non-porous items. Use ventilation to control humidity in wet areas, such in high humidity areas, such as kitchens and bathrooms, and also make sure there is enough ventilation within a building to control humidity. Ventilation is a really important tool in minimizing mold growth. Ensure any air conditioning systems you use are set up and maintained correctly. Maintenance is really key. And especially with regards to condenser dip tray, drip trays, and clean uh, re regularly changing filters. If you have building materials on site, make sure that any porous and semi porous materials are kept dry to prevent mold growth. The last thing you want to do is put uh, materials inside a home and then they start to grow mold. Where you have any localized flooding or leaks, make sure that you clean those up quickly, within 24 to 48 hours preferably. This makes sure that the mold growth doesn't um, occur rapidly, which, which is a real possibility in a flood type event. Um, and it just, just get some dehumidifiers in there and clean it up as best you can. And if you have a significant leak or flood, Call in a, um, a remediator, a mold uh, removal um, company to, to assist with the process. That's all on the mold webinar today. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we do have some questions, so I'll just start to go through those now. Uh, question one is Can carpet be saved? So, carpet is a porous material. So if it is heavily affected with mould, it can't be saved. It needs to be disposed of. If there is light, um, very light mould growth, uh, cleaning could be an option. But I would suggest that you get some testing done to, to validate that um, before you um, determine to keep it in place. Question two, is a vinegar water solution suitable for cleaning mould? Um, for cleaning mould on non-porous surfaces, I would just suggest um, that warm soapy water, you don't need anything further. Now there will be a copy of this presentation emailed to you by Chrissy, and it will also be on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to share the details of our YouTube channel to your colleagues um, and anyone else you might think would find uh, this information and anything else on our YouTube channel um, helpful. Uh, what to use on porous surfaces to remove mould? So if the mould is on a porous surface, we typically just dispose of that item. Um, there's not really a whole lot you can do to remove the mould once it is on those porous items. Um, you can try laundering clothing, for example, but especially if the, if the mould is heavy, um, it's unlikely to remove um, everything. So I would um, talk to a mould remediator before, uh, if, if you need some help with um, a large scale item, but best practice is to dispose. Uh, question five, how long do you have from wet until mould grows with carpet? So if you start cleaning up the next day and dry out over the next few days, will you get mould growth? Um, so that mold growth can happen very quickly within 24 to 48 hours, sometimes even quicker than that. Um, if you, yeah, again, cleaning up, 
um, getting as much water off the off the surfaces, off the carpets that you can, getting a dehumidifier in. Ventilation is really key, opening up doors and windows. Um, and to, to try to minimize the likelihood of that mold growth is really important. Um, why mold shouldn't be treated with bleach, especially for initial surface cleaning? Um, that's again because the um, bleach will react with mold and generate some additional um, compounds, volatile compounds that could um, cause health effects. So warm soapy water on porous um, non sorry on non porous materials is is all you need. Um, curtains mold so often grows on the back. Can they be saved or have to be binned? So again, um, curtains if they're a fabric curtain. Uh, porous material, best practice would be to dispose. Um, if you have uh, some curtains that are like plastic curtains, you can, of course, um, clean those, not a problem. Um, if you have that sort of waxy coating on the back of curtains that's affected, you might be able to wipe that. Um, but yeah, best practice is to dispose of fabric affected curtains. Are you able to are, we, are you available to contact if we have any queries in the future around mould issues? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, feel free to give me, a, click me an email or give me a call. My details are on the ChemSafety website. Um, my email is bridget at chemsafety.co.nz. Always happy to have a chat. Um, and yeah, please um, feel free to contact. Uh, what testing for staff should be done to check for any health issues? So if uh, staff have been affected by mould and have had um, chest infection, I would suggest that they either see the GP or an occupational physician to be assessed. Um, they may look at things like spirometry to assess lung function or um, you know there are other techniques that they can use, but the best thing to do is to get them seen by a physician. Um, Non-use of bleach or ammonia, is, is it just the reaction? Does this chemical kill the mold? May soap and water leave spores to grow? So on, again, on non-porous materials, um, it, bleach and ammonia will certainly kill the mold, but it will also generate volatiles. So I would suggest just soap and warm soapy water on non-porous materials is, is suffice. And number 12, can we provide samples to you? Best way to do this, particularly around remote places. Um, you can provide samples to us and we will get them analyzed for you and discuss um, what those results mean. Um, best thing to do is to um, flip me an email or give me a call and I can uh, talk through options with you. Uh, can you pop up your contact details? Yep, again on that website. And do I have a list of OC hygienists in New Zealand? Um, yeah, so look at the um, Occupational Hygiene Society's website, nzohs.org.nz, or go to the Hazens Register and you'll be able to find um, all of the Hazens Registered Occupational Hygienists on there. Okay, and um, that is all of the questions. Um, so that is the end of our webinar today. Uh, thank you very much for um, attending. And um, yeah, if you need anything more from me, um, all my details are on the website. Feel free to give me a call. Thanks, everyone.